How's it going everyone and welcome to chapter 5 in which we're going to be talking about gases in the kinetic molecular theory. And so one thing you need to remember about gases is they, they differ extremely from the other two states of matter that we've discussed so far, liquids and solids. And so in solids and liquids, you have to remember that these guys are incompressible, meaning the fact that their atoms in both solids and liquids are already touching one another. And so solids, they're vibrating in their fixed position. Liquids, they're able to move around one another. But we are still talking about incompressible states of matter in which these atoms are so close to one another, they can't get any closer. But on the other end, gases will bounce around all around their container. And so gases do not have a finite uh, volume or uh, shape. And so gases will take the shape and they will take up the volume of any container that you place them in. And because of that, we have to have kind of a, a new set of guidelines, some new rules for gases that don't typically apply to solids and liquids. And so the first kind of section that I'm going to be discussing in this video has to do with the individual gas laws and how they were, I guess, combined in order to give us what we now refer to as the ideal gas law. And so the first thing I need to kind of point out here is that these gas laws describe these physical properties of gases. And again, pressure, they talk about density, all these kind of concepts in terms of four variables. Pressure, temperature, volume, and the amount in this case is going to be in moles. And so an ideal gas is a gas that actually displays a linear relationship between these four variables. Meaning the fact that if you increase the pressure, you'll have some um, impact or some relationship that it will in, or change the temperature or change the volume. Or if you change the amount of stuff, you may change the pressure, the temperature, and the volume. But the way that these changes occur are going to be in a perfectly linear relationship. Meaning the fact you're not going to have an exponential change in temperature whenever you change the pressure. The problem with this is that there is no such thing as an ideal gas. But luckily for us on planet Earth, most gases behave nearly ideal, in which case we can use these equations and use these variables in order to solve for, the, solve for these unknowns, given some bit of information. And so the first thing I need to kind of point out, the difference between my slides that I'm going to be talking about here and the slides that I have available on Blackboard, is the slides I'm gonna, that are going to be presented in this video and actually in the future videos for chapter 5 are not going to go into as much detail as the slides I have available on Blackboard. And so I highly suggest and strongly encourage you to check out the slides on Blackboard. Please actually go through and read these sections in the book. It's just I don't really want to focus on the main aspects, sorry, on the aspects other than the main concepts of this chapter, which in this case I'm going to be talking about these three particular gentlemen Boyle, Charles, and Avogadro. And so as I mentioned in the book, in my slides, which you should be reading, I go into extreme like in, or depth when I talk about these chemical uh, experiments and how they were able to determine these kind of concepts. In this video, I'm just going to be focusing mainly on how, like their outcomes and what they actually discovered. So the first one, Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law was able to determine, not Boyle's Law, sorry, Boyle was able to determine that if you hold a gas at a constant temperature and a fixed amount of that gas, there is going to be an inverse relationship between volume and pressure. And please note how I kind of have this color coded here. At a constant temperature and a fixed amount, meaning the fact that you are not changing the temperature of this. You are not heating your gas sample up. You are not putting your gas sample in the freezer, nor are you changing the amount of stuff. You're not adding more gases. You're not letting any gases go outside of your like experiment here. But if you have a constant temperature and a fixed amount, volume and pressure are going to be inversely related. Meaning the fact that if you increase the volume, your pressure is going to decrease. If this goes up, your volume has to go down or vice versa. If you increase the pressure, your volume is going to start going down. And so this is kind of displayed. This weird little symbol kind of looks like an alpha mixed with a fish. This just means proportional to. And so all I'm really telling you here, or all Boyle is really telling you here, is that there's an inverse relationship between volume of a gas and the pressure of the gas. 
Or if you rewrite this, and again, we'll talk about this fancy constant here in a little bit. But if you rewrite this equation and just isolate your pressure and your volume on one side, that's where they get pressure times volume equals some constant. And right now, I'm not telling you what this constant is. That's why I'm kind of just leaving this very vaguely and telling you there is a proportion, or sorry, inversely relationship here. Charles Law. Charles Law states something very similar, but please notice the key terms that are changing here. On this slide, I tell you for Boyle's Law, constant temperature, inverse relationship between volume and pressure. When we move on to Charles Law, constant pressure, still keeping the volume fixed, but there is a direct relationship between volume and temperature. And so at a constant pressure, meaning the fact we're not squeezing on this thing at all, and we're not letting it deflate or inflate any more than we're looking at, and fixed amount, still not changing the amount of our gas, there is going to be a direct relationship between volume and temperature. Meaning the fact if volume goes up, temperature has to go up as well. If our volume goes down, temperature has to go down as well. And because I told you earlier that these are a linear relationship, it's going to be if you have, again, isolating your volume and temperature on one side, Volume, sorry, temperature will be divided by this side, and so volume divided by temperature is equaling to some constant at a fixed pressure and a fixed mole. And the last one we talked about is Avogadro. And so, yeah, it's that Avogadro that the, he had a famous number named after him, and then he just wasn't happy, so he had to make some rules that had to do with gases as well. And so, Avogadro's law states that at a fixed temperature and fixed pressure, the volume occupied by a gas is directly proportional to the amount of gas. And so once I read this out loud, this should kind of make some sense. If you have more of something, it's going to take up more space. And so what Avogadro discovered that if you have, again, 0.1 moles of solid CO2, not or violating any laws of science or chemistry here, if you have 0.1 moles of solid CO2, it must create 0.1 moles of gaseous CO2 because, again, we cannot destroy nor create matter, so everything that exists in solid form must exist in gaseous form as well, which makes some sense. As soon as the solid starts to get decomposing or sublimating into gas, those gas atoms are trapped in this little tiny area. They don't want to be just trapped in here, so they're going to start bashing up against the inside of the container, which contains a piston. And as they start beating on it, again, the piston's going to be pushed further and further and further up until we're looking at 0.1 moles of gaseous CO2 that increase the volume inside of this container by a certain amount. Let's say that we double the amount of CO2. And so instead of having 0.1 moles of solid CO2, now we have 0.2 moles of solid CO2. But as I suggested earlier, if you have 0.2 moles of solid CO2, you need to create 0.2 moles of gaseous CO2. And lo and behold, if you double the amount of solid CO2, you double the amount of gaseous CO2. And if we double the amount of gaseous CO2, it takes up twice the volume. And so here, I'm just telling you volume one going to volume two because we double the mass or the double the amount of atoms, it's gonna take up double the space which again, should make some kind of common sense here. If you have twice the amount of stuff, it's gonna take up twice the amount of space. And so here, it seems kind of like a ridiculous idea that Avogadro came up with, but the great idea that kind of came out of this is that Avogadro determined that this happens for any ideal gas. Does not matter the identity of this ideal gas. And so one more time, at a fixed temperature and a fixed pressure, the volume occupied by, now again, we can modify this, the volume occupied by any ideal gas is directly proportional to the amount. In this case, if you have the same amount of any ideal gas, it's going to take up the same exact volume. It doesn't matter if it's CO2 or argon or H2 or N2 or O2, any gas that we define as an ideal gas, the same amount of volume is going to be taken up by the same amount of complex or same amount of moles. And so equal volumes of any ideal gas 
contain equal number of moles. Please notice here I didn't say the type of gas. I'm just saying uh, if you have a fixed temperature or fixed pressure, any volume of any ideal gas is going to contain the same amount of moles, regardless of the identity of that gas. Which brings us to some kind of con like uh, terms that we have to talk about in terms of standards. And so way back when we first talked about these SI units, and I mentioned the fact that SI units are required because people around the world have different types of units. And so if you're in America, you can be using ounces. Please don't do ounces in a chemistry lab, but if you're cooking, then you may be using ounces. But someone else in Russia does not know what an ounce is. And so that's why we have to have some standards in our units. Very similarly, when we talk about gases, we use these standards in order to solve for this R. And so because we have some standards that in particular we were going, or we're going to be talking about here, Avogadro's Law, Boyle's Law, and Charles' Law is kind of what set these standards up for everybody else. And so the first thing that you need to commit to memory, because this will show up on an exam question or a quiz question, or it will show up on a question, I promise you. But if you hear the term STP, STP stands for Standard Temperature and Pressure. The standard pressure is always going to be one atmosphere. The standard temperature is always going to be zero degrees Celsius. But cannot use Celsius for like these kind of chemical reactions because you can end up having a negative Celsius, which violates a few laws of science and chemistry. And so in order to use the standard temperature, you can memorize zero degrees Celsius because zero is a pretty easy number to memorize. But you need to remember you need to convert that into Kelvin before you start plugging any of these values into your equations. And so STP, standard temperature and pressure. Standard temperature is always zero degrees Celsius. Standard pressure is always one atmosphere. So standard molar volume. This is why Avogadro's law is actually pretty important beyond the fact that more stuff means more volume. Because Avogadro's law led to the whole idea of standard molar volume. Please notice, molar volume is the volume of one mole of this ideal gas. And so one mole of any ideal gas does not matter the identity of the ideal gas. If you have one mole of that substance, it's going to take up 22.414 liters of that of space. So please note, I didn't tell you the identity of this gas. I just said ideal gas. I don't care the identity. If you have one mole of any ideal gas, it's always going to take up 22.414 liters. This is just the standard. This is just what happens for all ideal gases. And so on this depiction here, I am showing you helium, nitrogen, and O2. And in each of these situations, in this imaginary balloon here, I have one mole of helium. This one, I have one mole of nitrogen. Here, I have one mole of oxygen. But any of these gases, if I'm calling them ideal, they're going to have the same standards that I'm applying to them here of one atmosphere, one atmosphere, one atmosphere, zero degrees Celsius, zero degrees Celsius, zero degrees Celsius. But note, the volume for one mole of helium is 22.4 liters. The volume of one mole of N2 is 22.4 liters. The volume of one mole of O2 is 22.4 liters. And so the volume of one mole of any ideal gas is always going to be 22.4 liters. One thing I do need to draw your attention to, just because it's a little trap hole that I've seen a lot of students fall into in the past, is please notice I am saying standard molar volume. And here I'm talking about the same number of moles, moles, moles. And here in my big red letters, I say I'm talking about the same number of moles. But you have to remember, different atoms weigh different amounts. And so here I'm talking about the amount of complex. The amount is one mole, one mole, one mole. But when you start talking about mass, you have to understand that mass is different than moles. Because the molar mass of these things are different. And so if you see a problem and it's asking you about anything about standard molar volume or standard temperature or standard pressure, make sure you are talking about moles of a substance 
and not the grams of the substance. Because grams, as I've mentioned in several of my videos, and especially in lectures a few, at least dozens of times, is grams does not tell you anything when you want to know about the number of particles or the number of molecules in terms of these gases. So always convert grams into moles before you start doing any of this math here. And so, <clears throat> talking about these ideal or these individual gas laws, great thing about it is one thing you might not have noticed, but if not, then go back and like just rewind for a few seconds, you'll see each one of these gas laws had to do with volume. And so I mentioned the fact that Boyle's law had a re or noticed they determined sorry, determined the inverse relationship between volume and pressure. And so if, again, if we want to isolate our two variables, I can move pressure from this side as like underneath the uh, fraction here, multiply it to this side, and I end up getting a new equation of pressure times volume equals a constant. And now I'm giving this constant its own variable. Let's just give it R because that's what the people in the past did. And so here I'm telling you that Boyle's Law can tell you a brand new equation of PV equals some type of constant. And then Charles' Law, if you didn't notice, also had to do with volume. But in Charles' Law, he noted the fact that volume and temperature have a direct relationship. If volume goes up, temperature has to go up by a constant amount. And so keeping this constant the same constant I use for Boyle's Law, and just rewriting this equation, very similar, just replacing constant with R, I now have volume equals some constant times temperature. And then the last but not least, Avogadro's Law also had to do with volume. And they noticed that if volume increases, your amount of stuff increases. Or, sorry, that's actually vice versa. If you have more stuff, it takes up more volume by a constant amount. And so rewriting this equation using the same R for this constant here, now I have volume equals constant times some like moles. And if we combine all three of those equations, we now end up with what we refer to as the ideal gas law. And so the ideal gas law shows you a perfectly linear relationship between pressure, volume, temperature, and the amount in terms of moles. And so the ideal gas law was developed by three different experiments done by three different people in three different locations. They just all happen to be examining the same idea from different points of view. And so in this situation, if we have any ideal gas law, we already know the relationship between the pressure, the volume, the amount of stuff, and the temperature. And that relationship all goes back to this fancy looking R called the ideal gas law, or sorry, the ideal gas constant. And so if we want to know something about this, we need to do some math. And so using our PV equals NRT and going back to what I just mentioned a few slides ago about the standard conditions, the way that this number was determined is they just put everything in a standard form. What I mean by that is just because life is a whole lot easier when you deal with one of something, so they just kept everything in terms of one mole. When they use the standard pressure, which is one atmosphere, they use the standard temperature, which is zero degrees Celsius or 273.15 Kelvin. And we know at standard pressure and at standard temperature, when you have one mole of a substance, it's going to take up 22.414 liters. So just using this STP, standard temperature and pressure, using the standard molar volume and making our lives easier at one mole of the substance, they just plugged all of these values into pressure, volume, and in temperature and solved for R, and they got 0 0.0821 atmosphere liters per mole Kelvin. And so this is a very, very nice linear model. It's all it's really saying is that if you change pressure, it's going to have some influence over the volume, over the moles, or over the temperature, with this number always being constant for all ideal gases. And so one thing you need to remember, if you use this equation, or if you use this number for this variable of R, you need to make sure that your values actually match up with the units. And so if you were to Google ideal gas constant, 
you will find a whole list of a bunch of different variables or constants, sorry, values for these variables. But one thing you need to note, especially in this class for this chapter, if you're going to use 0 0.0821, that number is in the units of atmosphere liters per mole Kelvin, meaning the fact that your pressure needs to be in atmospheres, your volume needs to be in liters, your amount is usually always going to be in moles anyway, but make sure it's in moles, and their temperature needs to be in Kelvin. One problem that I've seen a lot of students run into is Temperature needs to be in Kelvin, not Celsius, because Celsius has its few little issues that if you start plugging negative values in for Celsius, you end up destroying the whole idea of pressure and volume. So try to avoid making black holes by using Kelvin instead of Celsius. So, now that we understand PV equals NRT, now we have a better idea what the heck this R means, let's start expanding our views here. So please note for this problem, the equation that I have written here, I'm talking about one ideal gas at a particular pressure, at a particular volume, the particular amount, and a particular temperature. But say I want to talk about more than one gas. Or say I have gas A and then I do something to it. I change the temperature, I change the pressure. Now I actually have to figure out how to relate two different gases or gases at two different states. And by states, I mean two different temperatures or volumes or pressures or something about those variables has changed. Great thing for us is, as I mentioned earlier, this R is going to be the same R for every ideal gas. This relationship between R and P and V and N and T is going to be the same exact relationship for any ideal gas. And so if we have two different gases or if we have two different gases at two different states, we have an equation of P1 over, or sorry, P1 V1 over N1 T1 equals R1. But again, if we're talking about a different gas or a gas at a different temperature, we also have a brand new relationship that says P2 V2 over N2 T2 is equal to R2. But as I kind of state up here, R is a constant, meaning the fact that R1 and R2 are the same number. Meaning the fact everything over here and everything on this side must be equal if we're talking about ideal gas. And so let's just get rid of these middlemen here and now we have a brand new system that we can use in order to identify any of these unknowns if we have basically some of the information already given to us. And so I understand this equation looks kind of creepy and scary because we're looking at eight different variables. But most of the time, you can either cancel out some of these variables, or the problem will say, here are seven out of eight variables, solve for the one. Something like this, maybe. And so Boyle's Apprentice finds that the air trapped in a J-tube occupies 24.8 cubic centimeters at 1.12 atmospheres. By adding mercury to the tube, he increases the pressure on the trapped air to 2.64 atmospheres. Assuming constant temperature, what is the new volume of the air in liters? So the first thing you need to do with these types of problems, well, I guess, let me take this back. First, do not freak out before you finish reading these problems. I know these problems look long. I know they are throwing a bunch of like values and numbers at you. The whole idea for most of chapter five is for you to just pick and choose what you're looking for, figure out what they're giving you, and then just kind of plug all these numbers back into your equation. And so for this one, I am telling you about, I guess, a certain gas at two different phases or at two different states. The first one, I have a volume and I have a pressure. And so we know pressure one and volume one. Because I tell you his air is trapped in a J-tube and occupies 248.8, or sorry, 24.8 cubic centimeters and it has a pressure of 1.12 atmospheres. Additionally, I tell you, hey, I am changing something about this gas. And so now you need to understand you're looking at something after some type of change. And so here I tell you a brand new pressure of 2.6 atmospheres, and I'm asking about the brand new volume of the air. And so here you can see that I changed the pressure from 1.12 atmospheres to 2.64 atmospheres. As I mentioned, these have a linear relationship to them. 
I mean, the fact if I change pressure, something else must change inside of that equation so everything stays balanced and equal on both sides. Additionally, you can actually make your life a little bit easier if you learn how to kind of look for these key terms. The first one is, I tell you that Boyle's apprentice finds the air trapped. And so if the air is trapped, it's kind of the same idea as if you blow up, an, or blow up a balloon and you tie that balloon off. You expect that the air is going to be trapped inside, so no gas is going to escape and no gas is going to enter inside that balloon. Same deal here. Whenever I mention the fact that the air is trapped inside of a J-tube, now I even state it one more time, the trapped air, so we know that volume is going to change, but the amount of your substance is not going to change. Additionally, I tell you very specifically, assuming constant temperature. And so we know trapped air is not going to change, so N is not going to change. And because I tell you specifically that it's at a constant temperature, I know my temperature is not going to change. And because of that, this creepy looking equation of P1V1 over N1T1 equals P2V2 over N2T2 now simply becomes a whole lot easier because N1 is equal to N2. And so in this case, if you have two values on either side of this equality are equal to one another, just drop them out of your equation altogether. The same do with the temperature. Temperature 1 is going to be equal to temperature 2, and so there's no point of even plugging these values in, specifically because I don't give them to you. And so here, you can drop out your temperatures as well. And so in order to rewrite this equation, dropping out, again, what I kind of canceled out here on the bottom of this uh, uh, fraction, now you have a brand new equation of P1V1 equals P2V2. And so here, because I'm asking about the new volume of the air, I'm just going to isolate my V2 here by dividing my P2 on this side and by that side. And so I have a brand new equation of V2, again, what we're looking for, equals V1 times P1 over P2. And the reason why I kind of wrote it out this way is just so you can see pressure will cancel out pressure. Final unit should just be your, vol like your like volume unit, or unit of volume. And last but not least, before you get too carried away and start plugging values in, the last thing I've stated from the previous slides is all of your units need to be in the correct form. And so pressures need to be in atmospheres because, again, the way we set these two things up equal to each other is using R. And as I mentioned earlier, your R is going to be the driving force of these units. And so pressure needs to be in atmosphere, volumes need to be in liters. Here we have our pressures in atmospheres, but our volume in this case is going to be cubic centimeters, so make sure to convert that before you start plugging these, equation, or these values into the equation. And so, as I state here, finally, the volume is given in cubic centimeters, but we need to make sure to convert it into liters. And so, just replacing all of my variables now with numbers, my P1, my V1 are given as 1.12 atmospheres, 24.8 cubic centimeters. My P2 in this case was given as 2.64 atmospheres. We're looking for V2. And then as I mentioned very briefly, N and T, constant. Don't worry about them at this point. And so just doing a little bit of quick math here, convert my cubic centimeters into liters by using the relationship of one milliliter is equal to one cubic centimeter. So centimeters cancel, sorry, cubic centimeters cancel out cubic centimeters. And last but not least, make sure your milliliter is in the correct unit of liters by converting milliliters to liters. And then last but not least, plug and chug. And so here we have now have our volume in terms of liters, our pressures of 1.12 and 2.64 were already given to us in atmospheres, so you just need to plug them into your calculator appropriately. So, this is what happens whenever I can assume that moles are constant and temperature is constant. Let's do another one where other stuff may be held constant. And so a helium-filled balloon has a volume of 15.8 liters at the pressure of 0 0.980 atmosphere and 22 degrees Celsius. I want to know what the volume is on the top of Mount Hood, Oregon's highest mountain, where the atmospheric pressure is 532 millimeters mercury and the temperature is 0 degrees Celsius. And so as I mentioned earlier, just take a deep breath and choose what I'm giving to you, figure out what you're looking for. 
So the first set of variables is look at whatever is occurring before you have any type of change with this gas. And so I tell you it has a volume of 15.8 liters. I tell you it has a pressure of 0 0.980 atmospheres and a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. And so volume in liters, check. Pressure in atmosphere, check. Temperature in Celsius, fix that. And so as I mentioned, temperatures in Celsius, they can cause problems whenever you start using these equations. So your temperatures must be in Kelvin. And so we know a few things about our gas before any kind of change occurs. But as soon as we take it to like uh, Mount Hood, some kind of changes occur. The first change is the fact that your atmosphere pressure is no longer the same as it was on the bottom of like on the ground. And so you have a pressure change from 0 0.980 atmospheres to 532 millimeters mercury. The second thing that's changing is the temperature. You're going from 22 degrees Celsius to 0 degrees Celsius. And so as I mentioned previously, our volume, sorry, volume is like unknown here, but our pressure needs to be converted to atmospheres and our, our temperature needs to be converted to Kelvin. So in this situation, volume is what we are looking for. What type of volume change occurred when you change the temperature going smaller and pressure at this point, I'm not going to tell you what it's doing because we haven't converted it yet, but your pressure is going to be changing as well. But please note, at a PV equals NRT, R, R is always going to be known. Don't have to worry about that because it's a constant. We know our P, we know our V, we know our T. We're missing moles, or so it seems. But as I mentioned previously, if you have a balloon, most likely unless you buy the cheapest balloons ever, once you blow up your balloon, you tie off that balloon, all the gas inside of there is going to be assumed to, or is going to assume to be trapped. And so here we can have a safe assumption that our moles is going to be fixed because we're using a balloon that we are going to tie off. No gas is going to enter, no gas is going to escape. And so just going through and doing a few conversions here in order to make my numbers look nice and pretty again. Volume, we're still set in liters. Temperature, we need to convert our temperature in Celsius and in Celsius to Kelvin by adding 273.15 Kelvin. We need to convert our pressures into atmospheres. Our P1, we're good. Our P2, millimeters mercury, needs to be converted to atmospheres using the conversion of one atmosphere equals 760 millimeters mercury. And so doing those quick conversions, now we have our brand new values. Volume in liters, temperature in Kelvin, pressures in atmospheres, moles, not going to change, don't have to worry about it too much. And so now using our PV over NT equations, we have P1, V1 over N1, T1 equals P2, V2 over N2, T2. And as I stated, Moles are going to remain constant, so you can do some quick math here and just cancel these bad boys out. And so in order to rewrite this equation now, dropping off our ends, we have a relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature is equal to the same relationship of pressure, volume, over temperature. And so in order to isolate what we're looking for in this case of our V2, again, V2 is right there, you need to multiply both sides T2 and you divide P2 by both sides here. And so I just have this rewritten out. Please notice how I have these kind of flopped here. And so because we're isolating V2, you multiply T2 up to the other side, hence why it's on top. And then you're going to divide P2 by both sides, hence why your P2 is on the bottom. And so I just set it up just so you can kind of see where things cancel out. You need to make sure that your atmospheres cancel the atmospheres and the pressures. Kelvin cancels out with Kelvin from the temperatures. Your final unit is going to be left in liters, hopefully if you didn't mess anything up. But after you have it set up this way, as I mentioned, we have one, two, three, four, five, technically six, seven of these variables. So all you need to do now is just plug and chug for the one that we don't have. So our volume came from our initial volume. Our P1 was our initial pressure. Our T2 was our like, uh, temperature after the change. P2, again, pressure after the change. T1 was the initial temperature. I highly suggest you writing these ones and these twos, or you can even write PI and PF if initial and final are your thing. But just make sure you write them out so you understand which ones, which numbers you're plugging in for what variables. 
And so I highly suggest you do a few of these practice problems on your own. And so I know on Blackboard I have a few examples, but if you are still feeling antsy and feel like you need a few more of these practice ones, type into Google ideal gas law practice problems and you'll find way more than you ever want to know that is, like, is even out there.